Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for um, NSBA's latest installment of the Service to Success series. Um, my name is Ian Elsenbach, and I'm manager of member outreach here at NSBA, uh, and we're, we're grateful to have you here today. Um, joining us, we have a fantastic uh, supporting cast who we'll introduce in just a moment. But before we do, I just wanna cover a few key ground rules. Uh, the first is that we will be taking questions in uh, the chat feature of this Zoom meeting. So uh, if folks can provide their questions there, uh, then we will look forward to answering them during the Q&A portion of, of our event. Um, as, for, um, as for the rest of the participation, if we can, uh, keep ourselves muted throughout the chat, then we'll make sure that uh, folks are able to, to hear the discussion properly. Uh, now with that, we'd like to uh, introduce our uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, joining us today from uh, Fed Sub Subcontract Solutions, LLC, we have Shauna Weatherly. Uh, Shauna is an NSBA member and a leadership council member. Uh, and she also comes to us with uh, over 30 years, or excuse me, 35 years of experience in uh, the public sector as uh, a procurement specialist uh, with organizations like the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the FAA, and the GSA. Uh, joining us as well, we have Keith King. Keith is the founder uh, and, and CEO of the National Veterans Business Development Council, or NVBDC. Uh, this is uh, a group that uh, is partnered with NSBA, and we partner with them on our veterans advocacy. Uh, and at NVBDC, Keith works to uh, assist veterans with uh, achieving third-party certifications for their businesses, as well as uh, helping veterans integrate into uh, the world of uh, contracting in the private sector through supplier diversity programs. Uh, and then moderating our discussion today will be Bill Belknap. Uh, Bill is, uh, like Keith and Shauna, an NSBA member and a leadership council member uh, who is uh, founder and CEO of uh, Energy LLC. And Bill, forgive me if I butchered the name there, uh, which, uh, which is a group that has earned uh, dozens and dozens of contracts in the public sector uh, throughout their time in business. Um, with that, Bill, I'd like to, to throw it over to you uh, to start us off with, uh, with a few questions about uh, getting started and integrated into the world of uh, contracting. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. First of all, um, thanks everybody to be on, on this call. You know, your uh, participation is a testament to your support of small businesses across America and, and certainly the uh, National Small Business uh, Association in particular, as we strive to help develop policies that are positive for small businesses and help uh, small businesses grow. So, uh, Ian, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, you know, uh, uh, started my own company 12 years ago. Um, we do construction with a, and federal government contracting, over 190 government contracts um, awarded. So I always say that, uh, you know, like a uh, major league batting average leader, um, if you hit 300 or if you hit three hits out of uh, 10, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame if you keep that up through your career. And so for us, uh, we have uh, we have a win rate of about one out of, uh, out of four. So if we won 190, they can tell you, you can extrapolate the math, how many we've lost and how many lessons we've learned. And I want to help to share many of those lessons learned positively and and uh, and in, in a uh, uh, good manner to help help those uh, help help many of you as well grow. So first of all, let me just start with uh, uh, as uh, Ian mentioned, one of our distinguished uh, panelists uh, today, Shauna. Shauna, uh, would you just give a uh, update on your experience with uh, you know uh, NSBA and, and in particular your your business? Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Shauna. Uh, thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm the president and founder of uh, Federal Subcontract Solutions, like uh, Ian and Bill mentioned. Uh, this is my second chapter, current chapter of my career. Um, and it's a chapter where I'm trying to create a knowledge base and research library that's kind of a one-stop shop for small businesses 
who are just even starting their federal journey or in the middle of it and need to know more information. So uh, I, I did that because during my first chapter uh, as a federal employee and a contracting officer and chief of contracting, I really enjoyed working with the small businesses that I would meet uh, who would come in looking for information and opportunities in the federal sector. And I just realized that there is a real need to share that information, uh, particularly more freely after one leaves the federal service and can provide that information, you know, from an insider's perspective, right? Um, helping businesses understand maybe what uh, federal agencies are looking for and uh, what they're trying to accomplish and the best way maybe to go about meeting folks. So um, that's why I'm here. Uh, I have quite a bit of experiences, as everyone mentioned, with the Corps of Engineers um, doing military construction, environmental remediation, operations and maintenance, even uh, was fortunate enough to deploy to uh, Afghanistan at one point. So I have some information and uh, experience over in the uh, uh, contingency space as well. And then I've worked for uh, FAA doing uh, spares and repairs and facilities maintenance and air traffic control, radar, things like that here in Oklahoma City for the Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center. Um, but one of the most uh, interesting places I think I've spent was at GSA and got a wide swath of uh, experience there, both on the program and the contracting side uh, and worked in FAR policy toward the end of my uh, career in the office that manages SAM.gov, um, which is where all of you will need to register at some point if you're going to continue your federal contracting journey. So uh, have a lot of information and good stuff to share today. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you freely and making sure that everyone has a good basis of understanding as you uh, proceed in your federal marketplace journey. So great. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Very much appreciated. So uh, our next uh, uh, panelist is uh, uh, is no stranger to um, small business growth. Uh, he has seen a lot in his lifetime. And Keith, uh, I'm not uh, any suggesting you're old or anything like that. Sure you but, are. But uh, you certainly have. <laughs> well, you certainly I'm, have an enormous. You know? <laughs> you certainly have an enormity of, of, of experience, which is uh, quite welcome, and very you. very glad you're you're here participating. So, Keith, with that, why don't you uh, please uh, share a little bit about your experience in small business? Well, I usually don't tell people I ran three companies, but I did open my first one in 84. <laughs> the current company, although it's been on what I call hiatus, um, is 25, 26 years old. So, in, in in the sense of working with small businesses, uh, obviously having run small businesses for a number of years, uh, my involvement with veterans, we helped write the law, uh, the first law which created veteran-owned businesses as contracting entities, uh, 10650. Um, we wrote in 97, it got passed in 99. And I got a call from my guys in D.C. saying, hey, you're one of the few disabled veteran-owned businesses that we actually know. We need to start doing this federal contracting stuff. And they had no idea what they were asking. They had no idea the workload. Um, and since my business had already been up and running for a number of years, um, I wasn't too excited about jumping into a whole new industry, but um, I did. You know, I spent the next 14 years doing federal contracting. Um, in, in, you know, with Shauna, um, I tell people, you know, even though my company was one of the first, I don't know, 2025 in America ever designated as a service disabled veteran owned business. Um, the amount of work that I did with the GSA and the VA and the uh, that's, uh, NIH and all of the organizations that I did um, provided a good living, but there was just something that kept bothering me. And what bothered me is how that business is done sometimes fairly, sometimes grossly unfair, unfair. Um, like any industry, but it just got to a point where I kept hearing about this thing called supplier diversity. 
And that was in the corporate world. And so I got curious enough to go and start knocking on doors. Um, it was 12 going on 13 years ago to find out what that really meant and what do they do. Thankfully, uh, the corporations were supportive enough to say, look, this is what we do, this is how we do it. Um, it's not the same in the government or as a government. We have different rules, different regulations, all those things. Uh, but, you know, we could establish one why veterans were disadvantaged as a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I came out of Vietnam disabled, so that was pretty easy uh, for me. <laughs> it's like, oh, you want to know? Well, here, I can write that. And uh, anyways, once we were able to put together the certification process uh, standards that the corporations adhered to, um, they said, go ahead and build it. We'll help you. And, and the companies that were jumping in, you know, I'm in Detroit, but the, the three automotive, uh, but also Kellogg's, AT&T, uh, a bunch of other companies that jumped in, Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, that all said, all right, we'll help you. And they have. And um, the last number I got, which was from a group called the Billion Dollar Roundtable, is that all these companies opened up $122 billion dollars in potential spend with the same or with uh, their supplier diversity program. And my point about all of that has been great. Let's make sure our veterans get a fair share of it. So I'll kind of bring you up to date. Great. Thank you, Keith. Well, there's no doubt um, that NVBDC uh, has uh, done an enormity to help veterans uh, get to get the certifications uh, required for uh, commercial entities. And, you know, I have to tell you that I've, I've got a dear friend yeah. that uh, has your certification. Yeah. He's now a $40 million construction company in the Philadelphia area. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, and he's, he's done really well um, in, in that space, which, which is awesome. So th thank you very, very much for that, for that update. You know, there's well, other organizations. Next time you talk to them, call me. I, I, I want to get the success story <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do. I'm really good at marketing. I, I'll push you out there. <laughs> sure. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate yep. it. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm seeing uh, several um, uh, chat uh, questions come in, comments come in, which is uh, fantastic. Um, Hopefully, we'll address most of those during this conversation. If not, uh, we do have a process to capture those. And after after the uh, uh, teleconference, uh, we can uh, uh, address those uh, uh, individually as well. So, um, you know, uh, we're small business owners, um, many of us, and uh, many uh, are here to start a business, uh, which is awesome. You know, I always say that, you know, uh, 12 years ago, uh, for those that are starting or want to start a business, I was in your shoes. I had zero revenue um, and a, just a dream of wh where to go. And But you know what? There's just such an enormity of help out there. And the NSBA is certainly one of those uh, um, organizations that helps uh, helps uh, uh, businesses, facilitates their growth. And, uh, you know, taking advantage of those for those resources that are out there is certainly helped to propel my, my business to uh, over, over uh, $25 million worth of contracts uh, since inception 12 years ago. So with that, let's start with the first uh, program question that we have. Um, the world of government procurement can be overwhelming for a business trying to enter the government contracting space. So, Shauna, where do you start? Wow. Yeah, there's a, that's a hard place, right? You don't know where to start. So um, I would say that if you're interested in any money that comes from the government, whether it's a contract award, a loan, a grant, financial assistance, things like that, there's one gateway for all of that. And it's called the System for Award Management or SAM, SAM.gov. Um, I know it well, that's the last office I worked in in GSA. Um, and I'm very familiar with that system. Uh, many of you may have heard of it. If you haven't, 
Um, you will because you must be registered in this system in order to get a contract award from the government. It's that simple. Um, you go through an entity validation process um, in which you'll receive what's called a unique entity identifier or a UEI. And basically what that does is that lets the government know that you're a valid entity and what your entity is all about, your business. So you'll enter information like core business data, like the type of business you are, your ownership, uh, the industry in which you want to offer goods and services in, um, maybe a little bit about your revenue over the last year or so. And then you'll answer some questions about business structure, security clearances. Are you interested in providing disaster uh, response support, things like that. And then there's some representations and certifications that are required by the federal acquisition regulation, um, which you'll learn a lot more about when you become a contractor. But uh, for now, um, it, you'll answer some questions about, you know, uh, EEO requirements and things like that. If you had past contracts and if so, have you complied? Little things like that, not a big deal. Um, but you'll submit that registration and uh, you'll go through a process in which your company will then be, receive an active registration. And that lets the government know, the buyers know that you're eligible to receive contracts of certain types. And uh, so that's the first step. And then this, the next step would really be looking for certifications such as the VET cert or the Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business Certification. There's a lot of federal contract programs through SBA, um, if you're a woman vet, you can also look at the women-owned small business certification, things like that. So uh, those are the two places to start, the SAM.gov entity registration, and then uh, looking at eligibility for Small Business Administration federal contract programs. Okay, fantastic. And uh, I, I'll ask a question and I, I, uh, with a quick uh, response to it. Um, do you have to pay somebody to get registered in SAM? No, no, <laughs> no, you don't. Please don't. And if somebody, and, and once you register in SAM, let me just give you a little warning. Once you register in SAM, there are businesses out there that will get your information because you have a chance to market as public or private. If you market public, which is, you know, a lot of people want to do so that other teaming partners can see they're out there and learn about them. Very basic information. Everybody can't see all your stuff. So don't worry about that. They can see certain information if they also have a record. But these businesses are going to start um, coming to you and saying, hey, you know, we can make your data better. I, I even get spammed with this stuff. And I recently got one that said your SAM.gov score is only a 70. We can help you up that score. Let me just tell you, there's no scoring. There's nothing like that that happens. Delete those emails if they're not from SAM.gov. They are not valid. You don't have to pay. Fantastic. Thank you. And I think it's the same thing with uh, certification processes, you know, be becoming going to the SBA and being certified as a uh, service to save veteran on small business. You don't need to pay anybody. Um, you can do it on your own. Now, if you need help, you can certainly reach out to the SBA uh, uh, on a, uh, for a counselor, either online or in person to ask questions. So that, that's certainly um, um, uh, available. Well, Shauna, thank, thank you very much for your detailed e explanation. Let, let's move on to Keith. Yeah. Uh, Keith, many businesses aren't aware that large businesses uh, offer similar contracting opportunities uh, for small businesses, such as the federal government has set aside for woman-owned small businesses, um, better-owned small businesses, uh, hub zone, et cetera. So how, do you, how does somebody access these listings of uh, similar um, opportunities on, on the commercial side? There is not a single point of entry like Sam is in a corporate world. But virtually every corporation, if you go to GM or Chrysler or Ford or any of the Walmart uh, and you type in supplier diversity, that will take you to that portal. It's a, and you just basically do the same thing. You enter your information into that portal. Even though a lot of people are impatient. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I, I registered yesterday. Well, I'm sorry, Walmart's a little busy. You know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't expect immediate return, but fact is that the corporations are looking 
And when something comes up that you may be uh, potentially a supplier for, they will in fact reach out to you, which leads me to the, the, the next step, much like Sean had said, get registered first. Well, actually, I want you to get certified first because that will definitely help you uh, in the sense that these corporations have been doing supplier diversity, started with the minorities 50 years ago. Uh, the women have been doing certification for about 27 years now. And then, of course, we have been doing certification now for 10 years. Um, so the corporations accept us. They accept our certification. So when they're going in on that sheet, that portal, they'll ask you, are you certified by the women minority or by us or whomever the gay, lesbian, or, or disability in? Um, and so they're looking for those certificates. They're looking for that certification. And what that does in the sense of it starts to provide you with the opportunity to talk to these corporations. My organization and the women in the minority, the three of us do a lot of business together and they were my mentors. So what will happen there is we are really pro probably more proactive than people think in the sense of our corporations will send us a pending RFP, RFQ, whatever, and we'll turn around and put that out to our database of certified veterans saying, hey, if you do X, this corporation is interested in talking to you, follow up and, and make that contact. So I think, again, it's very similar um, in the sense of the process, but get certified, get registered, and that's the way the door, as far as I'm concerned, is the way to get in. Sure. Great. Thank you. You know, I, I would say that uh, whether it's commercial uh, business or uh, government business, relationships matter. You got to develop relationships with your customer. Um, and, you know, I, I, some people would equate it to dating. You know, when you first uh, meet somebody and automatically get married, you take some time to get to know them, uh, to like them, you know, and, and then uh, et cetera. So same thing in the commercial or the business world. It takes it takes time to develop some relationships and some way the, some ways you can do that, certainly by getting your certification. And then, uh, as you mentioned, following up um, on opportunities, you follow up on opportunities by um, going to site visits. If there's a site visit, if there's a pre-award meeting by going to pre-award meeting and meeting people, introducing yourself, exchanging your business cards. So relationships matter. And it's absolutely one of the keys to business success. So thank you, thank you, Keith, for that uh, update. Now, if now, I, um, if I could. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. But I got to sure. go back to something Sean has said. And I, I think I may have mentioned this in the last session, but I am in the 14 years of doing federal contracting, I became a real advocate for the GSA. What the GSA does, they issue what they call a contract, and that's a real misnomer. What they do is kind of like a fishing license, okay? But in, and there's a whole standard to go through the GSA. But once you have, again, the term they use, a GSA contract, that is very much like our certification. It opens doors for you. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating anybody to continue doing federal contracting, but if that's where you're at and that's your, you know, what you want to do, um, I would recommend that take that extra time and get your GSA contract. Um, I can't tell you how many doors that actually opened for my business in all those years I was doing contracting. Great. Th thank you, Keith. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, um, a, a GSA contract is a, uh, um, a very, um, uh, a powerful way to go into, into government contracting. And, and let me tell you why, at least my, my view and Shauna, you can certainly, uh, express how, how you feel about it as well. But, uh, one of the highest burdens a contracting officer, if you put yourself on the other side of the fence, you know, contracting officer versus a, a government contractor, one of the highest burdens of a contracting officer is um, validating that the price that they're going to sign a contract to is a fair and reasonable 
expenditure of taxpayers' monies. And so with the GSA contract, you have a contract in place. You've already um, uh, uh, stated your pricing on that, your hourly wage rates, et cetera, that you'll be using on, on the, if a contract is awarded to you. And so that helps to reduce substantially that burden on the contracting officer. That's why it can be such a another reason for it to be a, such a powerful tool uh, for those that uh, want to gain business in, in the federal market space. So with that, let's go on to the, to the next. We got just a, a a lot of great uh, topics here to cover, and it, we just wish we had more time, but we we're limited on time. Uh, so, Sean, let's start with you. Um, once you're registered in SAM and you're certified, if that's the the way you want to go, how do you begin bidding on contracts? Okay, this is this is maybe <laughs> not a popular thing to say, but you have to take some time and do some research first, right? Because not everybody is going to be buying what you're trying to sell. And it's really, really important when you're starting to build those relationships and you're spending money on proposing on contracts that you're targeting the right agencies. So I think it's really important that you do some of that federal marketplace research first. And there's several ways to do it and several very um, user-friendly sites that you can do that with. One of those is usaspending.gov. Um, and Ian, I've given Ian a sheet of quick links with all these links here. So you don't have to worry about asking what they are or writing them down or anything. You'll, you'll have access to those at some point. Um, but usaspending.gov has some simple filters. You can go in there, uh, pick your industry and pick agencies or pick a fiscal year or a type of, of contract like a set aside for small business or service disabled veteran owned small business. And you can see who's actually done the buying. And those are the agencies that you want to start targeting first. It's not really smart to just start throwing bids out there and see what sticks on the wall, right? It's cost, it's not cost effective. So do your research first. There's also SAM.gov data bank, which is in the SAM.gov website. It shows reports on awards for the past fiscal year. And SBA also recently launched last fall a SBA data hub. And it's a very friendly site. It shows all the small business awards by a map. It'll show you the top 10 small businesses got awards in each industry, congressional district, location, um, all those things. So you can see who's winning and who your competition is, right? Get a feel for the marketplace. Then to find the opportunities, you can do a couple different things. You can set up uh, opportunity searches in SAM.gov for contract opportunities with their targeted agencies so that you can see uh, what's going on out there and keep track. It'll send you an update every time something posts. You can do multiple searches so you don't have to target yourself to just one or try and get everything in one. Um, agencies also have procurement forecasts for um, all the 24 CFO Act agencies. Those are the big ones like DOD, HHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Treasury, all of them, all the big ones. Uh, there's procurement forecasts out there uh, on acquisition.gov and all your target agencies will show what they're planning to buy, what they know they plan to buy this year and how they think they're gonna buy it. Are they gonna do a set aside? If they're not, and you see that coming up, that's an opportunity to start talking to that agency and finding the people there and influence how they're planning to procure. So if they haven't even thought that a, there's a service disabled veteran owned small business out there that can provide this work, let them know you exist, right? So that's a, another opportunity. And then there's commercial products out there that you can buy subscriptions for that will send you opportunities. Um, I'm not a big proponent of that because you can do all this for free. Um, so there's ways to do that, but, um, you know, when, as you're doing that and you're finding opportunities, just know that there's some differences in the types of opportunities. There's a few, um, you know, there's things like requests for information where the government's just trying to find out who's out there in order to inform their procurement decision. There's uh, requests for quotation. There's requests for proposal. There's combined synopsis and solicitations, all of them require you to read and understand what you're actually um, signing up for. So, uh, and they all have instructions on what you need to do, whether it's just submit some information uh, to let the government know you're out there and interested, or if it actually requires submitting a quotation or a proposal, uh, it will give you that information and a price. It'll give you that information as well. Great, thank you. So um, uh, one of the things that was mentioned was, uh, you know, getting gaining more information so the Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS, is also 
on SAM.gov. So you have the opportunities uh, are located there. Uh, anything over uh, $25,000 in the federal government system, except if it's classified uh, as an example, uh, has to be posted um, uh, and within the federal procurement data system. That's a great way to get information by, by using that, uh, uh, that, that search capability as well. So with that, um, let's have some follow-up. Um, some of the uh, solicitations require past performance. How do you win your first bid given that this is a, a requirement? So I, I, want to, I want to bid on a contract, but it requires me to have past performance, but I don't have any government contract. It sounds like, sounds like a catch-22 in, in a way. How, how do I overcome that? Yeah, well, that's that can be difficult. But the one thing you need to know that you can is that you can still propose on opportunities even without past performance, right? Past performance in information is really just one indicator of an ability to perform successfully. Um, you know, solicitations will describe their approach for evaluating past performance, and they'll talk about how they're going to evaluate offers that have no relevant performance history. So it'll it'll talk about the um, ability of the government to still con con consider your proposal, consider your opportunity, chance and, and you know, uh, ability to meet the opportunity, even without that. So uh, you, you won't be rated favorably, but you won't be rated unfavorably either. It's what they call a neutral rating. And really, neutral doesn't mean satisfactory. People think neutral means, oh, I'm going to get this satisfactory rating and somebody else will be higher than me. No, it's really just an indicator to the government that you don't have that performance. But if all other things are, are relevant, uh, you still have an opportunity to uh, propose and be considered. Uh, you're not punished, but you're also not rewarded, right? Because it's not there. So um, uh, one thing to know is the government can't exclude you from competition just because you have no past performance. So um, that's not anything to worry about. Even if it's not in the public sector, it, if it's in the private sector, uh, past performance can still be relevant. Great, thank you. You know, in my world, I'm sorry. Uh, in my world, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was just going to quickly say, in my world, construction, uh, there's a, a contracting uh, method called uh, LIPTA or low bid, lowest price, technically acceptable. And uh, technically acceptable, there needs to be some modicum that you're able to perform uh, on the contract. You know, if you have a private uh, that has a one year professional experience, how in the Dickens can you expect them to be able to perform uh, on a construction project, lead a construction project of $10 million? So right. there needs to be some modicum that you can you can actually do the work. And um, uh, within uh, my, my space in particular, um, you know, past past performance can be what you did in the commercial world. So I worked at a corporate environment for a number of years and I had uh, construction experience there, which I which I was able to put on my um, um, on my proposal to get construction work. So Keith, go, go ahead. You had something else? Yeah, the, the commercial part of this or the corporate world doesn't act or even consider some of the things that is done in the government. Um, and they don't have to. The rules, the regulations, all the things that they're stacked up in the federal government, not necessarily in the commercial world. And I can give you the best example, actually, Bill, in your industry. I won't name the client, but there's a rather large corporation who was building out uh, various uh, offices and buildings and came to me and said, I need a construction company. And the beauty of that conversation was, is I just, mm -hmm, no, you don't. I need to know, do you need a plumber? Do you need HVAC? What do, uh, do you need a project super? Which, break this all down for me. Because if I have a guy who slings drywall <laughs> and you get a general contractor who really isn't going to do any of the work, I want that general contractor to know about this guy because he's the best drywall guy I've ever seen type of thing. And that happens. It will, as you mentioned, though, again, I have been able to, with our certified veterans, put groups together 
I know that when, you know, I was looking at how can we help as many veterans as possible, all of a sudden, you, our corporation said, look, uh, they don't have to be a part of that company. In fact, I don't mind subcontractors, tier ones, tier twos, tier threes. I just want to make sure they can do the job and do it as best they can. And what I tell our veterans, look, don't go in there saying you can do everything. Go in there, lead with what you're good at. Okay. If, if, if you're the best damn painter in America, tell them that. All right. We don't be telling them all, oh, yeah, I could do cement when you haven't done it. <laughs> don't do that. And, and we have found that that seems to be more the way that corporations want to appreciate it. And secondly, honor it. Because again, as a veteran in particular now, um, I'm an army guy. But in Vietnam, my personal experiences was, is, you know, army, you know, uh, guys would come in with bulldozers, the engineers, and, and bulldozer part of the jungle, and then they'd leave, and the next group would be a bunch of Navy CBs. I'd be back here a month later, got a damn city built. You know? <laughs> so I got a lot of respect for the CBs, even though, you know, and I tell our corporations, look at the skills. It isn't always just this little pigeonhole. Take what they're really good at. And we've done that with software. We have done that with drones. We've done that with nuclear. I mean, I had a guy who was the, again, a Navy guy running the nuclear power plant of a submarine for eight years and said he couldn't find a job. He's like, come here. <laughs> <laughs> I know five people will hire you today. So again, those are the kind of things that I think is different than the, the contracting part of, of the federal government. Uh, but it's very similar in the sense of creating, you know, uh, relationships and those kind of things. But it's more like, hey, I'm really good at this. I have this skill. Here's my, and we use the term capability statement which is really not much more than a modification of some of the other credentials you're creating in, in the first place, uh, especially past performance reports. Uh, but again, in this particular case, um, I think that when you look at that step, what do you do? You know, lead with what you do well. Great. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's a, it's a uh, um, in setting up a business and running your business, you really have to align uh, what your passion is, what you what turns you on to to come to work every day. You have to align it with your 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 uh, your uh, uh, award winning or uh, your your best competencies. What are your skill sets that you bring to the table that other others are going to want uh, uh, to purchase? All right. So uh, Keith, with that, let's let's segue into um, what's the best way to get to know my potential buyers, uh, primes, and clients. Well, one thing that, again, even though I did try to do this when I was doing the federal contracting, corporations have meeting after meeting after meeting, and really, it's relatively simple. Uh, and what I mean by that is coming up is a national uh, women's conference. They will have somewhere around 150 to 200 corporations at that at their event. Uh, mine isn't as large as theirs. I have 50, 60, up to 100 corporations. The minorities will have even more than the women, but they're all there. And then the flip of that, and one of the things I absolutely, constantly, talking about being a small businessman or a person, I should say is what are you doing with your budget? You need, as a small business person who wants to do business in these corporations, you're going to have to travel, period. You're going to need to get face time at these kind of events, not just what the certifying bodies, but their own. I, I can tell you again, oh, most of the automotive have their own events, supplier events. Basically, all, all the companies do it in one way or another. So you can isolate it, but put a budget together for travel. And people said, what? Travel. Remember that? Airplanes? <laughs> you know, 
you need to have a budget. You know, the hotels. I mean, yeah, I mean, we looked at our own budget in saying, oh, my God, look at how much money we're spending on, on all of this. But we were able to make those relationships, meet those face to face. Uh, and so what we tell our vets, at least in, in the corporate world, look at what they're doing. Get invited or invite yourself, depends on if it's a public, what it is, and plan it and go there. We have virtually every, all of us are now doing what we call one-on-one -on -one meetings. We will have the, anywhere from the VP of purchasing to the local, you know, uh, buyer at these events. And they'll set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone who hopefully has the skill or the, the uh, product that they look to buy. And that's one of the, the, I had one of my vets come up to me and said, my God, man, I've, I've had more meetings with potential customers in the two days I've been here than I will for the last three years combined. I mean, it was, you know, just remarkable because the beauty of it is those buyers are there because they want to meet potential suppliers. Mm -hmm. I can Great. tell you all the federal things that was just like, go away, don't bother me. <laughs> you know? So I'm just saying, different attitude. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, well, well, thank you for that. You know, there's a enormity of conferences out there, as you said, get involved uh, and network, which is uh, which is about developing relationships. And, uh, you know, uh, if you're on the federal uh, uh, procurement side, um, you know, there's just an enormity of, of conferences you, you can attend. Uh, National Veterans Small Business Coalition has one in Orlando. Uh, SAMI, the uh, engineering um, uh, engineers have one uh, devoted to solely to construction, which is well, well, well attended. Sure. And so with that, let me turn it back over to Shauna. Um, you know, many of our um, uh, members and uh, leadership council members are not in the Washington, D.C. area, which uh, tends to be very centric about government contracting. How do you network with procurement officials if you're not physically located in, um, in Washington, D.C.? Well, I was a procurement official not located in Washington, D.C. for my entire career. So <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, we are out there and we are local and it's understanding who you have in your area. And again, who's buying what you're trying to sell, right? So uh, there's a couple ways you can figure that out. Um, again, acquisition.gov has uh, a lot of resources. I've listed all of them I'm about to say, but under, you know, I mentioned procurement forecasts, right? That usually tells you what office and who to contact about that opportunity. There's a procurement official. There is a, a requirements official who's writing the requirements, giving them to the procurement officials. Talk to those people on those forecasts, call and ask some questions. Um, that acquisition.gov site under the procurement forecast location also has all the small business office point of contacts, all the vendors opportunity sites. So it tells you how to do business with them. There's even communication plans for each of those agencies and industry liaisons. So all their names and information are all out there. You can start sending emails, calling people, finding them at conferences because a lot of the small businesses offices do attend all these national government conferences. Uh, SAME, Bill, you mentioned, has a great small business only conference. Uh, last year, I think it was down in um, Texas. Very good, very well attended. Um, so government conferences are another way. Um, there's also regional conferences and you have local SBA offices who have often matchmaking events that can be in person or online. Um, and another way to meet people is go to some of these webinars and other online small business events. You'll get the names of these procurement officials because they're the ones going to be talking to you at these events. So uh, you'll get their information, you'll get their contact information, you can reach out and talk to them there. Um, but I would tell you as a small business myself over the last year and a half, I have done all my marketing and outreach through LinkedIn. 
And if you don't have a LinkedIn account for your business or yourself, you may want to create one and start following these procurement officials online in LinkedIn. They give a wealth of information out there. You can contact them. They talk about upcoming conferences where they're going to be training, they're going to be conducting follow some of these offices and you can start to network with these procurement officials. I was a procurement official. I knew a lot of these people, but some of them I didn't know. And I've been able to make a post about what I'm looking for or some advocacy for small business. And these officials are out there monitoring and watching and they will, they will comment on a post that you create about a, a certain information piece of information. Or if you market your company, they will be out there looking. Procurement officials are out there online searching for you as much as you're searching for them. So, um, and just to, just to Keith's point, I want to say a procurement official that doesn't want to take time to talk to you is there can be a couple reasons why. And I just want to give you some valid reasons why. Number one, a procurement official may not be buying what you're trying to sell. And hopefully they will tell you that. But there's another reason. If you're trying to talk to them about a procurement that they're in the process of working on, they can't talk to you about it. They're trying to keep that playing field level and they can't tell you anything about that procurement. And to do so upsets that balance and can, can look like favoritism. So I just wanna let you know, if you're calling somebody in the middle of an acquisition, asking questions about it, Yes, the procurement official may may not be able to talk to you and may ask you to wait. So um, just the flip side of that, right? Not always because we don't like you. It's because there's reasons we have to uh, keep that procurement integrity intact. Yeah, it, it definitely has to, has to be uh, kept a fair process. If it's not, the, the contracting uh, officer actually invites a protest, which would stall the procurement process. So that's another reason to, to be fair and equitable. Well, th thank you, Shauna. Um, so moving right along, we've got about 10 minutes left. This is, uh, I really appreciate everybody's uh, answers and, and responses. Um, so I've sent in a proposal, either commercial or um, to a, uh, responded to a solicitation to a federal agency, and I didn't win the contract. H how can I get feedback? H how do I incorporate some lessons learned? Um, Shauna, let's, let's, uh, you're, you're on the air. Go ahead. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, depending on the size of the acquisition, the contracting officer may be required to give you that feedback automatically. There is a process for that for certain contracts over a certain dollar value. Uh, it's called a debriefing. Uh, you can get it at the time the contract is awarded. And let's say you're not selected, they'll, you'll get a debriefing opportunity, or you may get it if you're eliminated from competition earlier, you can ask for a debriefing earlier in the process. But if you're not offered feedback, ask. I mean, most contracting officers are not gonna have a problem giving you feedback when you're asked. Um, just be prepared that sometimes on smaller acquisitions, the answer could be as simple as your price. Um, a lot of smaller acquisitions are all based on low price. So, uh, you know, that's why you want to make sure you know who your competition is, you're pricing competitively, and um, you're making yourself aware of some of the prices that are already out there by doing some of that research earlier, uh, some of that research on who's buying, what they're buying, and what price are they buying it at. That's important to know as well. So um, just know if, if you don't get feedback, you can ask. It's that simple. Great. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm going to give a, 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 a tip that uh, to me is profound towards success, uh, whether it be commercial or, or government contracting. And that tip is, um, especially in, in my space, federal government contracting, you know, um, as a veteran, you know, we've served our country. Um, we, I, I submit a, uh, I, I answer a proposal. I take the time, the effort, uh, sometimes an enormous effort to put together a proposal and I, and I send it in to me. And this is my my thoughts. The government owes me some feedback. They owe me some feedback and how it can be better. They owe me some feedback at, at why I didn't get selected. Now, as, as Shauna mentioned, it can be going. The federal acquisition regulation has a debriefing request uh, a clause in it, so you can go through that process, which I have. And by the way, I've gotten tremendously valuable feedback from that written reply. Um, you can do it informally, and perhaps they'll, they'll give you some feedback. But there's also more things you can do. Number one, uh, the SBA has regional advisors 
you can make an appointment to go see a regional advisor um, at, at an SBA office or a small business development center. And you can say, hey, I, I, I responded to this. Here's my proposal. What could I do to be better? So that's another way to get feedback, valuable feedback uh, from uh, your, your solicitations that you post. Now, we in the military, um, we didn't just have one basic training and that's it that uh, we had training throughout continuously throughout our career. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that um, uh, as we had cr uh, training in our career, we got better and better and more efficient, whether it be gunnery, whether it be maneuvering, whether it be the various other exercises that are out there, we got better and better as, uh, as our career progressed and we had more training and we had more feedback on how we could be better. Same thing applies to business. The more lessons learned you capture, why you didn't win it, for some reason, price, technical performance, um, uh, et cetera, you capture those lessons in a very formal manner and you apply those lessons over time, you can help to be better and better and more competitive and have a, have a winning winning formula. So Keith, what, what else do you want to add to that? Well, it may sound silly, but it's not. Spelling, punctuation how you actually respond in the sense if they said, should I turn left or should I turn right? Give them the answer that you think is correct. Answer what they're asking for in this bid. I tell people all the time, they think I'm joking. I had a 183 page bid. On page you know, 181, it told me that they wanted my bid in a 11 font, 11, uh, 11 size font, Arial. Well, I did the whole thing, you know, in uh, times, you know, in Roman. And people said, well, really? I said, yeah, really. I mean, the problem is that I had to go back and redo the whole bit, you know, but that's showing that you're actually paying attention, that you're doing things. I can't tell you how many, how many times I've had a buyer tell me, they, you know, they were just amazed at how sloppy these reports were. They tell you this report is no more than ten pages, and the guy said in their brain, "Buddy, well, I give him twenty-five. What? No, 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 it don't work that way, guys. You know, you talked about training. Yeah, but Sean also said, learn the business and learn what you're doing, learn who you're talking to, and I absolutely agree." Um, you know, I, I I was in this long enough to also talk to the contracting officer in the federal space of saying, okay, I, I can tell that you did not write this bit. Tell me who in procurement wrote this because I'm in this business for 40 years. This is like throwing the kitchen sink at us and see what we'll give you back. What do you really want? She said, Keith, you know what? That's so nice of you to ask me what I really want. So, you know, it, you can build those knowing relationships, but respond to what they're asking you to do and do it correctly. You know, I think it's important that you represent not only your company and yourself, but you represent, especially if you're a veteran, you're representing all of us, good, bad, or indifferent. That's what's going to happen. Great. Th th thank you, Keith. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, we have just a, a two, maybe maybe three minutes left, um, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time to yeah. close at two o'clock. So, so Shauna, um, final minute or, or so, where can you find more help? Yeah, so the SBA has its general learning center out there at sba.gov. Um, there's also local apex accelerators is what they're called. They used to be procurement um technical advisory centers, PTACs, they're now called Apex Accelerators. And on the list that uh, Ian has posted, there's links to all of these places I'm gonna mention. So Apex Accelerators, you can find them with a map, uh, SBA Learning Center. There, specifically for veterans, there's the SBA Office of Veterans Business Development. There's a Boots to Business group. There's Veterans Entrepreneurship Program. There's the Veterans Business Outreach Center. And then outside of SBA, there's also the DNLO Institute for Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse in University. It's really good. DAV has a Patriot Boot Camp for military and veteran small business owners. 
And then there is also, uh, which some of you may be aware of, the VA Outreach Transition and Economic Development page also has a great site and they have a personalized career planning and guidance page uh, that's really good for uh, veterans trans transitioning out into private sector and uh, creating their own businesses. So those are some of the resources. And and again, there's more even listed on that that, um, that, that, that that's, handout. That's amazing. That's amazing. And most most of all of those are free. Um, yes, they're to, to yep. include, they're all free. And to include SCORE. Uh, so you may have heard of the SCORE if there's a chapter score near is good you. Too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And uh, you know, for me, uh, uh, as a CEO, how do you hold yourself accountable? Well, I've had a SCORE advisory group for free and they'll tailor to my needs and uh, meet with them once a quarter. Um, and you know what, when I go meet them again, the next quarter, after we've been given some advice, you know, I better have met those target goals that, that we established. Uh, so that, that that can be a great accountability for, for, a, for a CEO or a president. Keith, we have uh, just about, about one minute left. Please, what, any other resources that are on your mind to, to let the audience know about? I think, you know, sometimes as a CEO or president of the company, we take on all the other things that we probably aren't as skilled and we probably need more help. And one of the things I've always recommended is if you can afford it, there's two people you should get immediately. Number one is find the CPA uh, or a bookkeeper or other, somebody other than your sister or cousin, aunt, mother. <laughs> get you know, help, because they're going to be able to show you the budgeting and laying out. And the other person, again, is is a lawyer. I mean, the, the fact that I now, you know, have 20 some employees and now all of a sudden you're running into all of these legal things. It's like, uh, OK, yes, the lawyer is expensive. But again, budgeting, I am a champion of SCORE as well. Uh, they actually helped me back in 84 when I did my first business. So I, I have a long relationship with SCORE, Bill. I, I agree with you. But I think really you need to look at what you can do. You know, what is your skills? What is your heart? What is it that you want to do? Uh, you know, I talked to a whole lot of people who said, I, you know, I can't add two and two. Okay, at least you admit it. Now go find somebody who does. And, you know, you may not have a lot of money and you may not have a lot to pay uh, somebody a lot of money, but ask about it. You know, I got a, I talked to my CPA this morning and, you know, he said, Keith, I talked to you like once a year now. Damn, I got to pay you once a year now? <laughs> I used to pay him monthly. <laughs> so it's the kind of thing where look at it and make sure you, in my mind anyways, make that commitment to your business the same you'd make a commitment to anything else that one you care about. You know, I, I, I tell people, look, I've been married to the same woman for 53 years. I have children, I have grandchildren, I got great grandchildren, okay? Well, I feel responsible for the whole wing of that family. It's kind of like my business. <laughs> I feel responsible for all my employees. So look at what you can do and bring in the right people. Great. Keith, thank and you. Thank mind. you very much. Thank you, Keith. Ian, to take it home. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say Keith's being humble. Um, if you're looking to uh, get into procurement with, uh, with the corporate world, NVBDC is a tremendous resource. Uh, and we invite you to check, check out their offerings. We'd also like to say that if you're looking for more guidance, uh, the NSBA uh, is, is a great place to start. And it's, with our Veterans Network, we have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program, totally complimentary. Um, Bill has been, uh, been a stalwart supporter of, of those efforts. Um, and through the rest of our programming, uh, we, we give uh, tips each and every week uh, to help folks stay on top of uh, the evolving world of, of regulations and of legislation and uh, we, we keep our members up to date on what they need to know to be successful. So um, if you haven't yet checked us out, we uh, would love to uh, have you check us out and get in touch. I'll put my email in the chat and uh, we'll look forward to connecting further. Thank you. Bill, if you want to send us home. 
Well, just uh, everybody, thanks again for being here. Your participation is incredibly important. Um, and uh, also, uh, the goal was uh, to, to get a, a, a tip or two, maybe even more, uh, out of this program. And uh, I feel confident that, uh, that, that that's been met. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Shauna. Have a great day. And uh, we'll, we will touch base soon again. Thank you much.